This is a pop-up call in OGM uh, on Wednesday, January 26, 2022. Uh, it's motivated by um, a lovely conversation that was happening in the OGM Google group uh, where Sunil and Sam and Kevin and Grace and a bunch of different people and Jack were, were sort of riffing on and building on a conversation about collab collective sense making or collective intelligence or uh, hive mind or whatever you want to call it. Um, and Sam had posted a particularly uh, interesting riff on stuff that he had done. So I, I sort of called that one out of the thread. And uh, Sam, I'll ask, uh, ask you if you just want to sort of take us back in. But kind of what I want to do is add some water to the dried remains of that, that thread online and stir it back into life and then see where it takes us. And I also want to invite us to do some active weaving on the call as anybody is, is called or motivated to do. Um, small side note, I've been trying to figure out how to show my brain as my virtual background uh, so that people, so that instead of screen sharing and interrupting the entire call for everybody with my brain, which for like two out of 10 people is like, ooh, that's cool. And for the rest of us, like, hey, wait a minute, I can't see people. Um, they could just selectively uh, pin me and watch me, you know, uh, use that particular tool for sense making. Uh, but it turns out that the resolution of the brain as virtual background goes to crap and is unpleasant and illegible. Uh, so we haven't solved that problem yet. And I've tried turning the zoom to HD, which is the current setting, and it doesn't make any perceptible difference. I troubleshot with the brain people and they answered like, have you tried this and this and not, you know, we, we see the problem too. So that's not working so well. But Pete in the past has shared his background as he was busy crabbing with, as we're sort of calling it now, but using uh, sense making tools like Obsidian and, and note taking or HackMD or other kinds of things. And anybody else who feels inspired, please, uh, please do so. Uh, but it's lovely to see everybody uh, in the room and uh, maybe a way to walk into this conversation that would work pretty well is, so let me just pass the mic to you, Sam, and set up some of what, uh, you know, reconstitute some of that conversation. And then we'll go around the room and see as, as a kind of by way of check-in what, what we all feel about, think about uh, what you bring up. Does that make okay. sense? Sure. Thanks for thanks for giving me a chance to talk about this in front of everyone. Um, and well, in the in the conversation in the email list, it was just a kind of riffing off of other people's discussions. And I talked more about tools and processes. But I realized that I also did not talk about the higher level thing that I repeated in all of those examples that I gave of how I went about doing this. And a long time ago, in like you know 2007 or so well relatively a long time ago um michelle bowens invited a bunch of academics to this first peer-to-peer -peer, you know academic conference and i was presenting a sense-making approach there along with some other concepts and topics and some one of the other academics that studies peer-to-peer -peer issues he spoke up and he was like what makes you think that i want to work with you and I thought, hmm, you know, nobody ever actually put it to me that way before. And that stuck with me for a long time. And we all, we talked about that and so on. And I realized like when we, a lot of times when we're in these groups and we talk about sense making, it's more open-ended and assuming that everybody wants to kind of like jam together and put a big, one big soup together and explore open-ended. And I think that that is true or otherwise we wouldn't have OGM and all these things. But in a lot of the processes that I was helping facilitate, I started to realize that I probably needed to address like what's the outcome that people want to arrive at and whether they actually want to really pool their work together to get to that outcome or whether like in the threads, we heard some people say, let's pool our outcome together. And some people respond, well, I want to see, and then they would tell you what they would want to get out of that. And, and what it means is you could, and to me, it means that you probably could either do a hybrid where people are getting what they want plus a common pool resource or people could focus more on common pool resource or people could focus more on exploring something together but getting what they want out of it mostly and leaning more toward that end and usually i tend to try to help people choose that when i was doing these processes so the first thing that i do is try to choose are we working together in a collaborative way and try to do like a complete, let's say group 
um, inquiry, then I actually try to turn this into an inquiry and say, well, okay, now that we know what we're doing, what our motivation is and what's, what's, what's the pull and the demand for this and what the outcomes we hope to see, whether we're working together or, or just trying to meet everyone's individual outcomes, what are the questions that we're going to ask? And the, the questions define the reality that people are in often. And I don't, that's a quote from somebody, but I can't remember who there's some famous person says this, you know, but, but if we were all doing this right now, we would probably do well to think about like, what are the questions we should ask here? Even if you give yourself the permission to revisit the questions and, and enhance them or break them down, um, I've never gone wrong in doing this. And this is also what I did in the example that I talked about with Howard Reingold in Social Media Classroom. Um, there was already a defined way there to define how we'll work together. But then it was the students are coming up with, with sets of questions and then they're using these tools to answer the questions together um, in that case. So defining these questions that we're asking and then from there, then it, it, the, the process is the same. I, first, I'm deciding, you know, we're just deciding how we want to work together, what the goals are, defining the questions, then trying to model what we think. We've got to draw some kind of boundary of, around this, about how we're going to answer the question. Are we talking about infinity or are we talking about something less than infinity? We have to do it. So we try to figure out what the model is. And those who are good at modeling could be better at doing that task, you know. And it could be that different people have different talents and they could recognize that and say like, hey, I've, you know, I've modeled things before where someone else has said, well, I'm really good at pulling in data and querying it, you know, and someone else may not be do good at doing that and so on. So you could also figure out the roles that are needed in these kinds of efforts. Um, and then it's, and then I do try to, I tend to look for uh, data or qualitative, quantitative input into this model, um, whether it's environmental scanning of, of news articles, whether it's data sets that are available or whether it's creating a way to um, gather our own data, processing this and trying to figure out then for the people who are asking the question and everyone that is hoping for the answers, how to disseminate that information back to them in a way that's valuable for them. That it, different people have a different way of, of needing this information and using scientific jargon for people that are in the community might not work or using language for people in the community might not work for people that are expecting scientific jargon. So maybe there's multiple, we, we could try to identify what's, that's in, in all the, the only reason I'm saying this is like that is the system, no matter which way I've done this or what tools I've used or what it's been named or framed or however, that's right there is, is what I really was doing and what I described in that thread. And, I, and there may be that what people have in mind here it's not kind of on the same track, perhaps, or maybe it is. Um, but I, I think what, we're all nearby. I mean, I think I think um, uh, each of us has our own perspective and history on this topic, and we're, we're coming at it. And I'm, I'm actually trying to sort of surface that right now, just in, in yeah. starting with you and, and going around. And 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 the last thing I'll say is I could, and to the your point, I'm sure I could learn a huge, massive amount from all of you in the ways that you've gone about trying to solve or try to. Uh, achieve these kind of outcomes and the creativity that you all put into it. So I just described that. I don't pretend to be, I've gotten good results of using that approach. And that's what I was, that's the systematic way that I was describing this. And I can try to get into um, my own experience with using tools. And, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time learning data science, but I also spent a lot of time kind of like Peter Kaminsky and other people building and supporting tools that people use to collaboratively work together online. So I have that knowledge, but I feel like it would be awesome to hear what other people think, not just about what I'm, how I go about doing this, but how they go about doing this stuff and what you all actually want to see come out of this discussion. So that's, that's what I got. That sounds great, Sam. Thank you. That's a great, that's a great uh, entry point. Um, so let me go around the room and let's see sort of what this, uh, what you would like to add to that uh, in the conversation. And so I'll just uh, sort of pick from where my, my boxes are. Uh, so let's go Jack, Pete, Stacy for starters. My, <clears throat> my thinking is somewhat jumbled. I mean, I, I think Sam did a, a really nice job of summarizing a, a, a huge picture, an umbrella of what, what's really going on. Do we want to work together? That sort of thing. Um, but what I, what I do is I dive underneath that umbrella and think, what do I want to do? And what I want to do 
I started this out wanting to build a computer program back in the 80s that would make the human and the computer together smarter than either of them alone. That was the idea. And I got that from <clears throat> watching Paul McCready talk about the uh, Gossamer Condor when he first built it. He spoke about, about um, the Gossamer Condor was this monster 80 foot mylar wing that practically weighed nothing, which meant, meant that it was very much like a flea in the air. In other words, the air had more power than the, the airplane mass. So he spoke about the apparent mass of the airplane and he had to make the apparent mass of the airplane sufficient enough that it could main, be, may, remain controllable. Otherwise it would just be flitted around by breezes. And uh, so I thought about the apparent IQ of, of the human computer. Uh, Doug Engelbart corrected me and said, no, it's not about you and the computer, it's about us and the computers. And so that's when I, I changed. But fundamentally, I'm interested in remembering stuff because I have a terrible memory. Uh, a psychologist once told me that I was lucky that people that have perfect memories really aren't very creative because they everything's there. They, they, can't, they can't cut through the mass and think of something new. Um, and so I thought, okay, it's okay to have a bad memory. And of course, it's getting worse which of course is, has something to do with the color of my hair. But, but other than that, I'm interested in reminding systems and, and um, those came to light in, 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 in uh, basically in various places. Uh, but I'm also interested in connecting things. I found that I'm very good at sitting there quietly in a meeting watching people and then I will see a connection that nobody else saw. And so how do I, how do, in the Engelbardian sense, how do I augment that, but not just for me, but for us. And so I'm interested in, first of all, conversation. Conversation is king. Uh, it's, it's where your, 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 uh, your brain's kind of on an autopilot. It's making your mouth do things that it's all pre-wired and so on and so forth. And you never know what you're going to say until you say it. I'm, I'm not the kind of guy who will get up and talk in front of a mirror to practice a speech I'm gonna get. I just go out and give it, to hell with it. And, and whatever comes out, comes out. And sometimes I really screw it up and sometimes I knock a ball out of the park and that's fun. Um, so conversation for me is king, not debate, not, not argument. Now debate is a, a, an important part but not the argument side of, of what usually happens in, in pissing contests and, and polarized conversations. So I'm very interested in taming conversations. That's my big shtick. But in so doing, those conversations have to be meaningful. So I need a backside, a, a database sp system that is able to be there with me in real time while I'm thinking and talking and doing and we are thinking and talking and doing. So that's that's the big picture of what interests me. Over. Jack, thank you so much. That's uh, that's awesome. That's perfect. Let's go, Pete, Stacy, Doug. Uh, thank and Pete you. Has, Pete has dissolved into the ether apparently. That is weird. Um... Is this your phone doing something glitchy or what's happening? Uh, I don't know. Doesn't look like a choice on your part. But. Um, oh, it's uh, it switched to the wrong camera. I got it. Oh, I got excited. Go. I've got uh, mm -hmm, uh, kind of in the background and and uh, opening up and mm -hmm, switched to the wrong camera. Um, thanks. Sorry for uh, sorry for that glitch. Um, I am. I'm kind of going to pass. Um, I'm, I would be interested in answering uh, a, a question or two, but I'm not interested in expounding today. Passing is passing is totally legit. Uh, Stacy, Doug, Eric. Uh, Stacy, you're muted. So I like the question that Sam started with. What makes you think I want to collaborate with you? because that's what struck me at the time that I read his comments, there was another thread happening, which was the money thread on OGM. And I saw this as like a perfect example as if 
is if we isolated the different parts of money, then you would know which conversation you want you would want to go in on. Um, I'm also somebody that sees a lot of different kinds of connections. I can't do that if I'm deep in one thing, but if I can see an overview, you know, like I, so I may not be able to get into a certain conversation on a very deep level, but I can see something on the surface. And if something is mapped out well enough, then I can know how to follow the threads. I don't know if I'm making any sense. I'm looking at very, oh, some people, okay, good. Um, so that's why I was really interesting interested to hear what he had to say, because I also think that it would aid in actually doing the work and doing the collaborating if you knew exactly where to move yourself. Um, thanks, Stacey. I think that, I think that makes sense. Um, and funny enough, uh, you and I just got off an hour's call talking about sort of those dynamics, like, like uh, as I typed into the chat, basically power, personal safety, group dynamics, what makes people, what makes people feel a sense of safety to pipe up in a conversation and either share a lot and participate and engage and sort of, you know, make it, make it better or stand up and say, hey, this isn't working for me for X reason and, you know, uh, uh, prompt a change in the group dynamics or, or whatever else. Um, so we, we were there for a while. Let's, let's go Doug, Eric, David. Well, I have a long history with attempts to deal with sense making online. Everybody uh, in the car who, has a, who shares this, please raise your hand. Doug, you are in really good company. Good. Well, Sorry I'll go interrupt. back. 19, 1982, I was part of a thing called the International Leadership Forum out of La Jolla that was sponsored by a DEC who gave everybody rainbow computers and 300 baud modems. And we had conversations around the world. And it was incredible because the empowerment that came from being able to get a bunch of smart people to comment on current events was great. And it was so striking that it brought really interesting people like Michael Crichton and, and Marlon Brando were part of that group. Uh, as it got as time went on, it got stale. Uh, there was not, it wasn't new anymore. And so people started dropping out. I was very affected by that. I became part of two companies, uh, Metasystems Design and Big Mind Media that had conferencing software, but we could never make a solid business case for it. So it kind of fell by the wayside. What motivates me to be in this conversation is my puzzlement over the word sense-making. What are the hidden assumptions? The, I think that the, the metaphor of sense-making shifts us closer to the physical input of photons and waves going into the ear that the, we, we then make sense of. And whether that's the right way to deal with uh, knowledge and conversations. Uh, I think that, that I just am puzzled by that. Uh, my own preference for an approach to sense making is doing scenarios with multiple paths uh, that can be compared with each other uh, as a basis for conversation. But anyway, that's enough. Um, that's super, Doug. Thank you. Uh, Eric, David, Ken. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, one thing I like about the way you run these meetings, it's a round robin format, so everybody can get a turn to talk. There are other places we have to shout out and yeah, take, be a boss or something. But um, the when I the the models that I see are for people curating their own knowledge bases outside of corporate boundaries. I'm looking long term, and being able to share them with each other, with the people they trust, and then um, yeah, decide what to share. And uh, going back to some of the older models of early internet, early BBSs, just the, the, the quality that we had before it all became corporate, Facebook and everything else. Um, so um, I'm gonna be exploring some things with Marc Antoine um, he's got some good ideas, uh, but I'm also like 
looking at my own path, uh, what, what are the simple things that can be done? Um, and uh, I've been making a series of videos. I just did the fourth one. I'm going to post a link to it. I called it Harry Seldon's Vault. So if you knew that the world is going to hell in a handbasket, what would you put in the vault? Like say there's going to be a thousand years of darkness. Well, we should put Jerry's brain in the vault, definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, like how would people rebuild and learn from mistakes of the past? Or will they just make all the same mistakes all over again? It's just an interesting way of thinking about that. Um, but sense make I mean, there's a lot of censorship going on. And my recent uh, video addresses some of that, how that could be if people saved their own stuff and shared it peer to peer. Okay, I'll stop for now. Thanks. Love that. Thanks, Eric. Uh, and I, I, when you sent when you broadcast that around, I connected to you and to Harry Sullivan, um, and didn't have a chance to finish watching the video, but but uh, I'm interested. Uh, so let's go, David Ken Richard. Hi, everybody. Nice to meet you. Um, I've been interested in sense making, collective sense making, for a couple of decades. Um, I've built systems for the intelligence community for collaborative analysis, been very interested in futures and foresight analysis. And um, we, we design and build these kinds of systems. We also build knowledge management systems. I have designs for personal knowledge graphs, which you can query and add structured knowledge into or add unstructured knowledge and then add whatever structure you want later. The problem that I, run into with personal knowledge management is there's a huge barrier to uh, adoption. Most people will not spend the time to manually type stuff in. So if you really want to be a player, you'd have to integrate with a lot of the tools that people are using anyway, like their calendar uh, and email to name one. Because if you wouldn't, then you'd expect the human to have to manually move a lot of stuff and how can we claim to be really helping people with personal knowledge management if we leave email and calendar et cetera et cetera et cetera app out of out of the equation right and we can't expect people to do that knowledge management entry not everyone is as diligent as jerry um and a friend of mine named howie who lives with the brain open all the time um i've tried to identify and give credit uh, to the people who came before us on whose stand shoulders we were standing, whether we realize it or not. In the chat, I put in some names, uh, John Warfield, Alexis Christakis, who hopefully is still alive, I haven't spoken to him in a couple of years, and Tom Malone at MIT. There are many others, who, Stafford Beer, who, who, who saw the need for collaborative sense-making to support decision making in government or in business, and didn't just you know spout oh collaboration is a good thing, but actually developed really thoughtful methodologies and analytic and conceptual frameworks for this. Some inspired by physics and math, and 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 some very you know multidisciplinary in their approach. So I've collected a lot of documents about sense making. Uh, that term has been used a lot in the DOD community and in the intelligence community. Uh, yesterday, I got a, 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 the new edition of Harvard Business Review and a Gartner analyst is talking about sense making in the context of sales. Where, Don't let anybody talk about sense making. Where, right, where modern, basically they're saying that when you're selling B2B solutions, the most successful sellers are actually engaging in support of course, they're, they're engaging in sense-making on behalf of the prospective customer who is overloaded with information about the products in the market and, and needs sort of this very gentle facilitation to formulate the business case for why, why this product might be a good fit. Not a heavy-handed, here's a ton of information about our product, we're the best, we're the best, we're the best, but really kind of very uh, curated uh, all, you know, support for the, the buyer's decision-making process. So I'll wrap up by saying that if anyone wants to be a thought partner in the domain of personal knowledge management, and I, I, is this being publicly released, Jerry? 
Uh, yes, I'm recording and I'm my habit with these calls. I should have said this at the top for those of you who are new to these I calls is I post these openly on YouTube. Right. Well, so if anyone wants to, to, to take sort of a, a, a parallel track or additional like specialized track on either personal knowledge management tools of the future, what could they look like? Or um, a big topic for us, we focus now on law firms. We used to focus on emergency preparedness and national security. Now we exclusively help law firms. We wanna help law firms look over the horizon at the risks and opportunities that their clients are going to face. And, you know, the, it's, it's not like even large law firms, and I would guess even most large enterprises have a lot of people sitting around with time in their hands, waiting to be tasked with the kinds of activities that people do in the context of horizon scanning and, and, and strategic foresight analysis using structured analytic techniques. Like, no, they don't. So that's why there's a market for consulting firms that do this kind of work. And yet, shouldn't this be a core capability, at least for a small group of people in large corporations? Everyone is so you know, short-term oriented with very cursory, superficial, over the horizon attention, it really, there is, a, there is a profession of future studies that has developed tons of methodologies for doing this in a very organized way. So if anyone wants to uh, brainstorm about these things in the future, um, it's easy to find me and I'm happy to, to talk to you about it. That is awesome. David, thank you so much. That's great. Um, uh, we are busy weaving stuff together here. Let's go Ken, Richard, Mark. Hello, everybody. A um, couple of questions come for me. What makes sense in the world of sense making? What kind of sense are we trying to make? Um, I'm really aware, as I always am on these calls, of how many white guys there are. Thank you, Stacy, for being the uh, lone y, uh, X chromosome here. And you know, we have a, we live inside structures that bound our sense-making abilities that we need to open up and have other people involved with, right? So um, another question that arises for me is, what kind of listening are we applying? So um, Otto Scharmer was not the first, but he did a very good job of, of articulating four levels of listening, downloading, which is just looking for agreement, um, uh, what to do when somebody comes up and says, no, I see things differently. How do you interact with someone when they have a really different point of view? And, and how do you stay in your body when that goes on? Um, the level of empathy, how do we build systems, both human and computer augmented systems that have empathy built in, that have us understand what it's like for the other person to be who they are. And um, then the last one I rename as enlivening listening, which is comes out of my work at the World Cafe. We believe that the future is always born in conversation in the moment. So every moment there's the future is being born. There's something there that's alive. And how do we listen for what's alive? What, what's going to bring us alive if we follow it? What's going to create a good future? So those are some uh, types of, of uh questions that are popping up in my mind around that. And I just want to say one other thing, since the Gossamer Condor and Albatross has brought up, um, I use that as a great example of um, how businesses completely ignore the limits of humans. Uh, the pilot for the Gossamer Albatross was someone who was uh, sort of a Tour de France level bicyclist. And they discovered by being very careful and analyzing that he could sustain 70% of his output over time uh, indefinitely, as long as he had fuel, water, and, and, and glucose and stuff. If he went over that for very long, like to 80%, he'd have to drop down to 60. If he went to 90, he might have to drop down to 50, he went to 100, he'd have to come to a complete stop. So they had to, to couple the pilot with the plane so they didn't go in the drink. And I assert and posit that the body and the brain are one. And if your body can't sustain more than 70% long-term over time, neither can your brain. And so this idea we have to always be working on 100% is actually quite in dehumanizing. And it's a terrible way to go about uh, the business of business. And it doesn't make any sense. Um, Ken, thank you. Is there, do you remember if there's an article or a research study about that aspect of physiology relative to the design of the condor? And I'm sure Pete is Googling it as we speak. Probably. I. Um, uh, 
I'm recalling this from, I think it was a frontline report back in the 80s, because it was when I still had a TV. I got rid of my TV in 1990. So it was a frontline or one of the PBS you know, uh, stations did a whole thing on this. And so I'm drag, dredging this up out of memory. But I have actually looked a couple of times uh, online, and it does say it's the 70%. Um, so if you're, a, if you're an audiophile, you know that you want overhead in your stereo. So if uh, a, large, a really big passage comes on with a lot of volume that your speakers can handle it and your amp can handle it, same thing with humans. We want to be working at a level where we have overhead to really put forth a super effort when required, but that we are taking care of ourselves and not overstressing our bodies because too many of us are overstressing our bodies and we can't make sense when we're too stressed. Makes sense. Uh, makes sense. Ha, huh. uh, Jack. How about that? Um, so this is kind of fun. Um, those the 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 gossamer condor flying tests were done at uh, a little airport near Bakersfield, California, and I I happened to know Paul McCready, so I stopped by there on my way to L.A. once and uh, ended up having lunch with with Brian Allen and Paul McCready and Peter Lissaman and and the rest of the tribe. Uh, a very short story, um, Paul McCready's young son, Tyler, was one of the first to actually pedal the condor. And he did that in the, in the, in the uh, stadium in Pasadena where they do the, the Rose, Rose Bowl. Bowl. And um, uh, McCready told me this story when he was, he was getting ready to build this thing. He built the prototype and they took it over to the Rose Bowl Stadium and his son, Tyler, was doing the pedaling and actually got it to fly. Well, Tyler was walking around in the hangar where these airplanes were with a little piece of, of uh, styrofoam that was cut in the shape of, a, of a, like a boomerang. He put it over his forehead and started walking, and the boomerang just stayed right there as, as, because it was flying on the bow wave of a little tiny breeze over his forehead. But it was, it was at that time we went out and had lunch that they had been doing those dynamometer tests on, on uh, Brian Allen. And so it, the, the numbers are exactly as they reported them back then. It's, it, he, could, he could do 70% um, and, and that he would have these short bursts. Now, when they actually flew the albatross across the English Channel, he, uh, he got cramps. And they were they were busy in the process of bringing him down to anchor him to the to a towboat and and just take him away. Uh, when he got a second wind of some kind and managed to make it to the shore, but uh, those numbers that that are reported are exactly right. Um, love that, Jack. Thank you. Um, it's funny how few how few degrees we are from life events and world events and things like that, even in this group. A uh, small thing I wanted to pull back into the conversation that Ken, that you brought in at the beginning, or at least that you triggered in my mind, and it takes me over to a book called The Healing Wisdom of Africa by Maladoma Somme, because I think to a group of white guys, sense-making may, may be very much about um, only sensory information, only facts, only logic, and making arguments that are crystal clear and so forth. And then there's this other side of that, which we've talked about a little bit, which is trust and, you know, you could try to convince me with facts all you want, but that doesn't seem to work. I'll just double down on whatever it is my, my, my system believes. But then there's this other side. And one of the things I learned from Healing Wisdom of Africa was that uh, shamans are gatekeepers to the other world. And that in many cultures around the world, that other world is as real as our sensory world, which in the Western world we have privileged and have said that is the only reality. And so sense making in other cultures, and I think we need maybe more of this, um, involves crossing over through those gates into other realms, other senses, other places, other spaces. I don't know exactly, I don't even have the language for it, but, but not losing those sorts of things because if we approach sense making or collaborative sense making with only the kind of Western stereotypical description I just gave it, I think we'll lose traction, lose contact, and lose a lot of important things that are actually in, in our space, in our shared spaces. Um, so I just wanted to bring that back into the conversation a little bit. And wow, Pete found uh, the VO2 max uh, levels and all that kind of stuff. That's super cool. Um, so see, facts are good too. Um, but thank you for this. Uh, let's go um, Richard, Mark, Rick. Richard here. Um, 
I'm new to the group. This is my second call, but Jack has been kind enough to take me under his wing a little bit. And uh, when I ask the question, suffering from imposter syndrome, I, I would probably ask the question, what makes me think that you would want to work with me? But I'll toss that out as a as a different view. But um, I'm freshly retired from the United States Environmental Protection Agency, where I spent a lot of time both in the field as a geologist and then in the latter half of my career, I worked a lot with communities and communicating with them. So I'll just give my perspective. I don't know if it has much to do with sense making, but I think it does. Uh, one of the things that I use as my tagline, people say, what do you do? Uh, what I generally have come to say is that I take a thousand page scientific document and turn it into a Twitter feed. So the challenge is to uh, communicate with people who are heavily vested, who live near potentially hazardous waste sites, which is the worst condition of all. If they knew it was hazard or they knew it was safe, they could move on with their decision. But in the potential world, it's terrible. And uh, so I had to go into these communities um, and talk to them. And, and one of the things that I came to understand is that uh, if you're not delivering the information in a way to the audience so that they can have an actual uh, impact on the outcome, then they're not participating. So it, 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 it's important to understand that while we can develop all kinds of great technical, you know, documents and all that, if we can't deliver it to the audience that's going to be affected by it, it's, it's not, we're not doing our job. I'll, uh, one other thing that Stacy said about scale, uh, I'm huge into scale. Uh, if we were to look from the universe in, we would see the answers. And, you know, as we move closer in, we get more and more myopic. But I'll close with a story that happened to me when I was working up at the Oak Ridge Reservation, the nuclear bomb factory up there. And uh, we did this wonderful presentation. We had the people with the white coats and the whole bit standing up in front, and they showed a lot of graphs and charts. And it was really great. We really proved our case. And afterward, this fellow stood up. He was a, probably a fifth generation farmer. And as I remember, he even put his fingers behind his overall straps. And he said, uh, yeah, that's all great, but I don't believe in science. And it went down my back like a lightning bolt because I realized that I'm being paid by him. And so I can't just blow him off. I can't just say, well, too bad. You know, science is the way it is. So it really changed my course of my career to become much more um, in vogue of a uh, communication as opposed to just understanding, you know, instead of understanding, we have to be able to communicate. In fact, I'm blocking that word, but it says we're drowning in information, but starving for wisdom. So unfortunately, I can't give credit to it. I just found it out there in the information web. And so I don't know where it comes from. But um, anyway, that's why I'm here. And so that's my viewpoint on things. Um, Richard, I love that. Thank you. And I think that quote comes from Consilience uh, by E.O. Wilson, but it's, it may come from other places, but that's where I've got it in my brain. Um, and, and I've just added you to the thought science popularizers because that, that notion of turning, you know, thousand page scientific reports into a tweets is, is like really important and, and listening to people who don't believe in, in the science and communicating with them in some appropriate way. We've had several conversations in OGM recently about the movie Don't Look Up. It's like, you know, is, is, is that reaching people who might not otherwise listen to other arguments uh, about climate change? Do they see the metaphor? Or is it working? I don't know. I'd love to find, you know, studies that are trying to figure that out. Uh, let's go Mark, Rick, Jordan. Thanks. Um, and since I don't normally do the, the OGM calls, the Thursday OGM calls, I'll just, just briefly introduce myself. So I'm another brainiac in terms of um, I've put together a, a brain for climate change. And it's, it's certainly the largest and only one that I know of in terms of trying to use the brain technology to uh, tackle a wicked problem. And so we've, we've spent about 20,000 plus hours putting information and organizing information in the climate web and it's open access. And we're, what our primary challenge right now is trying to figure out ways to to overcome the barriers to people using something like the climate web. And we've got several things going on along those, those lines. But, but the very pragmatic thing that I'm grappling with right now in terms of, of the topic of, of this call is that for any of you following climate change, you've probably heard of carbon offsets. Um, you know, I worked on the first carbon offset 34 years ago. 
and they almost died out the way they, they probably should have. Uh, but now they're back with a huge vengeance and all sorts of people are saying carbon offsets are going to save the world. Voluntary carbon markets are going to save the world. Most of these people have no idea what they're talking about and you know what history tells us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, but what I'm going to try and do is set up sort of carbon offset office hours with the brain and using, you know, having conversations and going back to some of the first questions that were, were asked, not, you know, not to convince people of anything, but both to show people that resources exist, but also more just to share information among potentially sort of this universe of people that are suddenly working on carbon offsets at, at eight different cross purposes, not knowing about each other's work, not having any idea of what's come in the past, what the literature is, and is there some way to do that with the brain uh, and then exporting the information from the brain that, that perhaps accelerates our progress? If we're going to use carbon offsets, which we probably shouldn't, but if we're going to put billions of dollars into carbon offsets, couldn't we make it a little more evidence-based? And is there a way to use sort of sense-making with the brain to help that process along? And that, that's what I'm going to be trying to do. Love that, Mark. Thanks. I put a couple of links to your work and also mentioned that you and Pete have collaborated to try to simplify access to the brain by creating these microsites. So uh, the link I added was a link into my brain where I've collected up all the microsites that you've broadcast to us. There's probably a bunch more you've worked on, but those are the ones that I've seen. Um, and, and Wendy, thanks for joining us. I'm explaining, uh, Sam sort of put a stake in the ground at the beginning of the conversation. We're all building on top of that. And I think you'll see the pattern as we go. Uh, heading toward you, but you're last in my in my Google dis in my Zoom display right now. So um, at this point, uh, it'll be Rick Jordan Shimon. Fascinating conversations. The second time I've come, and uh, I, I, I'm a, I'm a lurker, and uh, this is drawing me in. So uh, it so happens. Yes, indeed, indeed, I'm drawn in. Um, I'm in Dubai at the moment, and uh, I'll just share one piece of information. And it, it, it triggers on the brain uh, talk you had at the beginning. But I went to the Russian booth. I mean, their, their, their pavilion. And they had this um, three-dimensional brain up. And it was, it was unbelievable trying to explain how the brain functioned. I'm not going to go into, down that rabbit hole. But the end of the conversation ended on what they regarded the most important thing. Can anybody guess the word? I'm not going to, I'll just say what it is. It was cooperation from Russia. I thought, what's going on? So, I mean, I was just, you know, flabbergasted by it. Um, and actually, I, I, I want to I reframe the original question by saying, why are we not working together better? And I think that might be a better way of framing it from my point of view. But you have to address the flip side of the argument to go to the other side of the argument. And the other reason why I came was because somebody, it was about civil war. And I, I'm thinking about <clears throat> the uncivil war of neoterrorism. I'll share my definition in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the link here. But the question that I came up with listening to this conversation was, and it, it ricochets from the, the, the experience I've had today, is why have we not figured out how to develop the long-term governance systems and processes needed to redress the political abuse of power. I'm Rick and I'm done speaking. Um, Rick, thank you so much. Uh, speaking of Russians and cooperation, uh, long ago, and a couple of you have heard this story before, but long ago I decided to read some of something from an anarchist. So I did like Peter Kropotkin and I started reading one of his books from you know, a feared anarchist. And the first half of the book is completely lovely stories about cooperation in nature among animals and about how wolves hunt in packs and termites and ants and all the stuff that we would learn from E.O. Wilson and except mm -hmm. before E.O. Wilson had written all his great books. And it, it was all about cooperation. And, and I fear that, that a great deal of why we don't co collaborate is, is about the politics of the world and power. And we don't talk about power often enough. Um, I did a bunch of work with the Institute for the Future and power was always the 800 pound gorilla in the room and politics was something we just never, almost never touched. It was really interesting. That's a big mistake. I agree. I totally agree. Um, Jordan Shimon Robb. 
Uh, Jerry, may I uh, may I punt till after I hear from a few more people? Of course you may. I, I just okay. just throw me at the back end. Sounds great. Uh, Shimon, Rob, Michael. Well, this is a fascinating conversation. Uh, my interest is actually in computational brain development. Recently, I've been focusing on how the brain and mind are created to make sense of the world and more from a, trying to understand some of even the mathematical probabilistic framework in which we make sense of the world, how we predict things and what happens when our predictions are not met by the reality we face. I uh, just retired as a psychiatrist. So I think for me, kind of brain development, how people make sense of their environment in the universe are very important. And I apply it in terms of the conversation here about somebody spoke about politics, how to apply some of it to our political sense and belonging. Uh, the thing that was interesting when someone was talking about, I think the gentleman who was working for the EPA, I actually come to this conversation from another conversation or you know seminar of uh, the National the National Academy of Medicine together with Robert Wood Johnson, who have this notion of culture of health. And this is an ongoing process where they're trying to understand how to create health in communities, how to create flourishing people, how to deal with inequality, how to deal with you know, inequity. And those are areas that I'm very interested in, in terms of making sense in communities. And the thing that they were talking about, and they had a lot of their grantees trying to figure out a new way to measure outcomes for grants. Because until now, grants have gone to people who had power, who were able to put together a good grant you know, proposal. And then they measured the outcome. They had organizations measuring outcome based on whether they're able to get more grants and things of that kind. So the thing that struck me the most was they had people from Native American tribes and they talked about how to measure outcomes by incorporating the community before they do anything else to make sense of what's going on. And the thing that was intriguing to me was they mentioned the different sense of knowledge. And one of the knowledge bases that they work with is lucid dreams, people talking about the information they get from their elders, and that's just as re real for them in terms of making sense of the grant or whatever they're working on as the scientific information. So I found that fascinating. Thank that's it so for much. me. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Um, Rob, Michael, Wendy. Hey, thanks for uh, having this call. Um, I often can't make the OGM calls, even though I kind of track them and stay uh, included as best I can. I think um, I think sense making is why I've been attracted to OGM all along, and so I'm excited to see kind of a focus. Um, maybe I'll approach it from a consumer of OGM, like what would I be looking for? Um, and I think a couple of people have talked about the overwhelm we're all feeling. Um, there are things, there are things that I take as facts. There are probably things that are facts that I don't know about. So I want to get more exposure to those, those things. There's probably things that I take as fact that are actually not true, whatever true, true means in today's age. Um, so I, I look at sense-making as trying to gain perspectives, points of view, data that are in context, and maybe more important weighting of those things. Um, so as Mark was talking about climate change and, and as uh, I've, I've been through a lot of his, his brain efforts on, the, on that, um, you know, I'm looking for something that helps me uh, allocate my time and attention into Hey, this aspect of it's really important and maybe is under under discussed, underrepresented. Um, or when we look at energy usage, you know, are we are we considering peaks and valleys, and are we considering distribution costs, and are we considering 
mining of materials to make solar panels and the recycling of batteries. You know, none of these issues are easy, otherwise we wouldn't be here. And so I'm, I'm looking for a shared knowledge understanding to be built over time. Um, one of the challenges I have with looking at someone else's web or brain or, or knowledge base is because I wasn't part of building it, it may not feel as familiar. Um, and I know Jerry's been, been working on that point. So how can we meet people where they are, have them learn through the collective and le learn and contribute back to the collect collective around key issues of our day um, and I think it's very challenging. Um, and, and so that's, that's kind of where I, you know, I use the brain. That's how I found Jerry. That's how I found OGM. Um, I use it a lot less than, than, than I know he does. Um, I do like connecting things and the act of connecting things feels important to me. I don't know how much I go back and use my connections, but, um, you know, the, the climate, regenerative agriculture, energy, economy, Bitcoin, health, all seem related to me. And I don't know how to necessarily connect all the dots. And, and at the end of the day, why do I want to do that? I want to, I want to either take actions in my life consistent with making things better, whatever that means. Um, and I want, I want to have, I want to start having more of a holistic, consistent view of things across those different domains. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there. And that's kind of my, my take on sense, sense making. Um, Rob, thank you. And I, I just want, I just want to express my gratitude to you for in our various and funny conversational media and OGM and all that for trying to pull us back toward making sense together and actually practicing what we preach, eating our own dog food, which is such an awful metaphor. Like who came up with that? Um, but but really your, your your efforts to bring us back yeah, to doing this. Did. Who did? Pets.com? Yeah. That could Some be bitch. <laughs> so um, so thank you. Thank you for that. I really, I appreciate it. And I want to live up to that. And I, I'm off at the fungus face of my own little brain tool, which you know Mark Trexler and I are really familiar with, and a few of the rest of you have used a little bit. But that's not a collaborative sense-making tool at this point. And so, how do we how do we bridge that gap and, and start doing this together in ways that touch right. the different things that we've been bringing into the conversation? And I'm not sure a mirror board is either, but you know, there's there's some some space to live in. Exactly. And, and, and I'm really interested in what that shared idea space looks like. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not Wikipedia somehow. It's, it's different. Uh, Kevin, go ahead. Well, I've been spending uh, <clears throat> some time working with the donut economics folks, Katie Rayworth folks. <clears throat> and in some places that works really deeply locally, but it only works really deeply locally in places that have incredibly dense social and capital networks who have looked at what their town is. So there is a zero carbon Guildford in the UK, but it was arising where uh, the Totnes uh, group did the transition towns. There's one uh, in North Devon where the UNESCO Biosphere Reserve is kind of their global model. And they've got uh, two things, uh, Plastic Free Devon, 25 towns have signed on to, and um, then a donut, Devon. And then the other is in Birmingham, UK, where uh, the best of the impact hubs did the most uh, deep community work and real transformation of zoning and other things in urban settings where Emmy Cower and you know, Indy Johar are, are building. And so for, for places that have gotten really deep grounding one generation iteration ago, the donut is making sense to get everybody engaged. And it's, you know, it's where you measure your, <clears throat> yourself against the planetary boundaries that Rockstrom cooked up, but in a really pleasant way that 
you know, and, and it's the one that gets environmentalists to care about poor neighborhoods because they're in it together, which is, isn't typically, and it also gets the economic justice folks engaged with the, uh, the environmentalists, which is often, you know, a, a, there's a gated community away. So it, those three places are, are really exemplary, but it's because I've known of their work for 20 years that now Donut is making sense of it. So it's interesting stuff happening. And, and I think that the first thing you said is really crucial, which is this is all taking off in communities that have really strong bonds, that, that, that the, the web of relationships and trust is essential to these things to actually sort of take off. In some cases, the work can build that trust, but, but you need an opening, you need a door somewhere, and this needs to have a spark someplace. Uh, Rick and Sam, then let's complete our round. Yeah, I'll be very brief. What, what I'm struck by is the, the richness and the wisdom of the collective of this group and all the information and the limitation of singular monologues. Uh, we're not really having general, and I understand the limitations, but I was just thinking, is there some way of, of sort of making this public? Okay, you've got this, you've got this YouTube, you know, would there be a, a monthly LinkedIn newsletter that we then all commit once it's published that we go in and share our and and try and create this sort of uh, self-organizing, self-generating system that goes beyond. You may already be thinking along these lines, but I'm just thinking that there's so much here, so many threads that I could go off that it would allow us a venue to go to, to, to go off on a different threads to see where they might and then anchor that on a regular basis and you can you've got this public document out there on linkedin or wherever you want to do it but anyway reactions uh, so you are speaking the gospel of ogm and at least our intentions if not our actions uh we have been having very similar conversations to what you just said in the last couple of days uh, among the different sort of standard calls that we have during the week uh, we're, we're trying to puzzle this thing through. And I'll say that we have almost two years coming up now of calls that go to YouTube, different artifacts woven and different memories, whether it's in you know, uh, markdown documents uh, with notes taken or other sorts of places. We wanna say something else, Rick, go ahead. Very quickly, I'm, I'm listening to the book Rules for Revolutionaries, which was, um, was about Bernie Sanders um, campaign and there are so many lessons from that. One of them was you have to think incredibly big to get people in. You get everyone involved. You let them tell their stories, their personal stories, particularly people who are not involved, who don't have a voice, to try and, and try and sort of crowdsource people around a central issue, which is uh, the future of humanity. What could be more important than that? I'm done. Um, love that. Uh, so, so you're you're. You are preaching to the choir in some sense, and yet, uh, you know, Rob's frustration with us not sense making enough, and what you just stated, like, um, I would love for more of this to actually be a, a thing in the world. Uh, we're leaving a trail. It's just that our trail is hard to love and hard to pick up and hard to sort of participate in. Uh, Sam, I, you know, kind of related to what um, Rick just talked about, but responding to what um, to what Kevin Jones talked about with donut economics, I didn't, and then, then this is all relevant to what we're talking about, but I'll just try to say it really quick. I, don't, I, don't, I wasn't aware of the concept of donut economics until Kevin Jones introduced it, other than just hearing a little bit about it. But once I looked at it, I realized that was exactly what I was trying to do in the community you know, economic development work that I was working on. And one of the things that I uncovered was that everyone else that was working on this left out the voice of the people in the community and they never asked them like, how is this, you know, it wasn't part of the picture. And that, and then, and that really seems related to the sense making discussion here. And many times, it, if we come up with these processes, tools, approaches, uh, you know, it, it would f follow the pre existing pattern. So you can't really blame people. And it's the other thing that I found is when I actually dove in and try to do this, it is hard to have a, a good way to support ongoing feedback from people in the community. So to get the voice of people that you're and actually have them not just not just being studied like subjects, but have them be a constant part of whatever decision making is happening through these lenses. So you can put a lens of donut economics or anything, but to make this a way that actually has 
they're, you're taking information and at the very least you can produce insights that they can use immediately is one of the goals that I had. And that's a, that's a sense-making cycle. Um, so I think it's relevant. It's probably a whole nother side discussion to this core discussion, but I thought, I just wanted to reflect that from what, you know, the participation with Kevin on uh, donut economics. Thanks, Sam. Uh, I just want to, before going to, to Pete, I just want to throw in a little bit of personal experience from long ago. One of my mentors was Russell Acoff, who taught at Penn. Uh, so I went to Penn for grad school and West Philly is kind of a mess. And there was this very interesting conversation that came out around development of a people or place. Like, is it is it humans that you want to focus on or place that you want to focus on? And one of the things that the ACOF wound up doing was they created like a young, great society working with uh, folks who didn't have a lot of privilege who were in West Philly and some really brilliant standout humans came out of it who then kind of graduated out and went on to other programs and launched other things. And if you follow the people's trajectory, it was pretty awesome. And if you look back on the Young Greats program, it kind of languished and died. And so, so I started thinking that like, the more contagion there is among people and the more leveling up there is among people and, and, and connecting across the people, probably the better, but I'm not sure. And all of that was happening in the days before the inner tubes where you could share stories and make all this stuff really kind of available in different places. Uh, so so we're, we are in new waters now. And I think that the easy availability and overwhelming availability of information is our opportunity as well. Uh, we just need to make this make sense like the tweets that Richard is busy crafting uh, as opposed to some tangly web of thorns that you know uh, that you need some like acacia tree that you need to climb in order to gain some some piece of wisdom because acacias are very unpleasant to climb pete um thank you jerry and um i want, wanted to give a shout out to rick or a thumbs up or whatever you would would say um taking conversations like this and um, kind of annotating them um, with knowledge facilitation and then kind of making them public and making them persistent over time um, uh, is, is a core part of what I'm doing in OGM. Uh, and uh, we've had some experimental successes. Um, uh, I, I took a call, not kind of, not unlike this one um, and made a wiki out of it uh, with lots of links and you know rich detail. Um, I'm also working on just the wiki technology for that uh, with some of the other folks, including Bill. Hi, Bill. Um, uh, Wendy Elford and I uh, have got a project right now where we're doing that uh, for a, a panel discussion that Wendy, um, uh, Wendy moderated uh, about water in Australia. Um, there's, a, there's a really amazing river uh, in Australia um, that the Aboriginal people have lived with for 20,000 years or whatever, and they think of it as a being, uh, not as a resource. Um, it's a, you know, it's part of the living earth. Um, uh, so then there are also uh, more recent um, uh, people in people who've come to Australia who think of water as a resource. Um, so uh, working through kind of the, the conversation of that, um, Wendy had a great a great uh, like hour and a half discussion uh, earlier this year. Um, and we've taken the recording of that, made a nice transcript, uh, added some links to the resources and, and maybe we made a bibliography out of it and, and have put that on a website. Um, we're probably going to start to release that soon. Um, it's in, in final, final vetting and, and uh, we'll probably get it out next week. Um, it's it's been watched it, interesting watching Wendy do that work. Um, uh, the the people uh, on the panel were all women. Uh, there were three women: um, an uh, Aboriginal um, woman, uh, somebody who's from blockchain because blockchain uh, is is potentially a way to kind of manage uh, water going forwards, and then um, an expert in water law and policy. Uh, she's she's uh, specializes in personhood. Uh, personhoods for rivers. Um, rivers can be legal people, and then they can you can sue you know for damages um, against your person. Um, so that's a technology, legal technology that people are inventing in different places of the world and using to to better and worse effect. Um, uh, anyway, 
uh, that that kind of stuff is is happening. I want to say it's hard work. Um, it takes a lot of hours and a lot of uh, intelligence and um, uh, and I guess uh, Wendy's Wendy is kind of figuring she's partnering with uh, Kenevan uh, Australia, which Kenevan is kind of related to um, Dave Snowden's Kenevan in in the UK, um, uh, and she kind of sees a path forward for continuing the conversation about water, um, which is really important in Australia, kind of like it is in the Western US, um, over time and continuing to do these kinds of workshops and continuing to build kind of a public presence of the information. This could be done with, with any topic. Uh, it could be water, it could be uh, soil health, it could be regenerative agriculture, it could be um, monetary policy. Um, uh, so there, I, I guess, yes, let's do this. And it turns out that we have to figure out how to um, uh, pay for pay for time for people like me and Wendy and, and you know, the person who helped do the transcription and the person who helped do the web graphics and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's a fairly, it's, it's actually not a, a huge investment compared with all the other investments that we could make, but it's also not a free thing. Um, and so that's, that's the message that I come back with from doing it in the trenches for a while. Thank you, Pete. Um, let's complete our tour. Let's go Wendy Jordan. Yeah, fabulous discussion. Thank you so much for everybody and hi to people I have not met before. Um, yeah, so I, I'm the kind of person who loves to think uh, about systems, and I'm also a kind of person who loves to be efficient. <laughs> I'm also the kind of person who really doesn't want to make something else that already exists just slightly different. So I've really spent the last year listening to what's going on um, with all the different people, what all they're doing. And what really started to merge for me about a month ago, and it's turned into a project I call the tapestry, is this, God, it, it really relates to everything everyone's saying. So it gets me excited. You hear my voice start to crack a bit because I, um, what I'm hearing is that we need a framework where we can put our own pieces in, where we can take the puzzle that we can't yet understand and break it up into parts so we can at least start putting our puzzle pieces in grids or in sectors so that we can find each other in smaller, in smaller spaces and see the resources, see the funding that all relate to that space. And so what I did was I put together something that ended up being kind of a cube of a grid. Um, and uh, so it's complex enough that it needs technical support, but it allows people to say, answer a questionnaire and have the pieces be put in the grid and then have them be able to see where they fit inside the grid. And the reason why this is super important, I think is because first of all, it's focusing on the people not necessarily on measurable outcomes. So it shifts our perspective in valuing measurable outcome to say quality outputs. What, what, what does this community have to offer? It also puts a, a, a framework around seeing things holistically rather than in parts. So while there might be one sector or one domain that sees something they feel from a completely holistic and full perspective, they don't even know the things that they're missing. So that's the third thing is that by putting things in a framework or, or attempting to create a holistic framework, we're starting to identify the holes, which sometimes there can be just as important, if not more important as the synergies and the connections. Um, and so this finally would enable us to have a sense of a feedback loop, right? We could start asking questions we can't even begin to ask now, or that only few of us see clearly enough to begin to ask now, which is why does this hole exist? Should we maybe continue to you know, talk to people from this particular domain or this particular sector? I can see this kind of thing, if this, it's in its beginning stages. I literally was running late because I was deep in thought about how to frame the questionnaire that would allow people to self-identify their pieces. Um, I could see this being used not just for large communities like this one, but when people leave conferences or when people have a, you know, a group uh, has a solution and they're trying to see if the solution has a holistic application and what ripple effects it might have and what it might be missing in terms of considerations. I think there's a lot of different ways to use it, a lot of different ways to set up the X, Y, and Z axes on this. Um, 
to me, this is the reason why it came into a grid form was because I've been trying to do this on a much more complicated, much larger level with a user interface that is too complex for what technology can actually do right now. And so I backed myself down into, oh, wait, I think we can do this in a grid. And I started to come up with ways in which to frame it. So I'm happy to give a separate presentation if other people feel that this uh, would be valuable to, to either learn about or know about more, um, or even just even send the questionnaire around when I've got it in uh, a somewhat usable form. Some of us in, in subgroups of this of OGM are starting to play around with it already. But to me, whether it's that, and I'm not attached to that at all, it's just, I feel like I'm putting together one potential stepping stone towards what we've all been talking about because that's what I'm hearing we need and we need it sooner rather than later. So I wanted to stop waiting for the technology to be developed to create the ultimate version and let's get something like stuck to the wall and see what happens if we start playing with it. So thanks everyone. Thanks, Wendy. I think a bunch of us are throwing spaghetti. I think not enough of it is actually sticking to the wall. Um, Jordan, and then uh, Bill and Gil, you guys joined well into the call, but we've just been making a go around around a stake in the, in the sand that Sam put at the beginning of the conversation. But I think by now you've seen kind of the kinds of contributions. So happy to go to you after Jordan uh, and see if you, you would like to sort of check in with reflections on, on where we are. But let's, uh, let's go Jordan first. All right. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, see if you're meeting for the first time. So I'm I'm coming in just for a little background on mindset as a uh, as a builder of large scale infrastructure, who's been held accountable every day for the last twenty years for whether intention is or isn't coming into reality measurably every day in the form of you know roadways and reservoirs and you know uh, projects like that. And so what I'm thinking deeply about is how we uh, how we transition from uh, from discussion to action that actually brings into reality the things that we've all had in our hearts for the last decades. Um, so I'm going to pull a little a couple threads and then I'm just going to I'm going to make a fairly pragmatic um, suggestion in case anybody is interested and moving forward. So there's been a lot of a lot of conversation about how we're seeing parts, but there's some kind of whole. Um, so, you know, Jack talked about um, conversation and dialogue being king. And, and so then the question is like, well, what are we here talking about? Um, Ken talked about, you know, what is it that we're trying to make sense of? Um, you know, Stacy talked about how do we know, you know, where to look, how to inform ourselves, how to move ourselves. Doug talked about, um, you know, being able based on trying to figure out where we are to project multiple scenarios and paths out in the future and to be able to compare those and then act in the wise right manner to bring forth the future that we want. You know, David talked about the strategic foresight and the actual career and skill set that that is. And I would think that all of our different vessels, whether they're organizations or nations or tribes or societies, you know, ought to be ought to be doing that. Um, Ken talked about the integration of sense making not only as a human species, but in a sense that honors the totality of the living system that we're inextricably embedded in and in service of. Um, Jerry talked about, in addition to the facts and logic, the whole other side of the the realm of spirituality and and wisdom and and the the wisdom of the elders and the visionaries and the people who can maybe see beyond into something more eternal than the the temporal problems that were that we're stuck in. Richard talked about how maybe if we could look from that universal view, we could start to see the answers. We could start to maybe locate ourselves and, and look down and see where we are, how we got here, you know, where we might go. Uh, you know, Jerry talked about how we neglect power and the 800 pound gorilla that we have set up an entire structure as a species dominated by very powerful political and systems and oligarchies that are all competing and vying for space and power. So you, you can't, you ignore that to your peril. Um, you know, Shimon, if I'm saying it right, talked about, about the sense of belonging and maybe we're trying to do something like flourish in a functional community that meets all our needs. And maybe we should be more intelligently measuring how we're allocating grants and resources as we try to figure out what stands in the way of human flourishing and how we create it. 
Um, Kevin talked about the silos between people working on environmental issues and social justice issues and economic concerns. And maybe it's true that a leading cause of environmental degradation is the poverty and lack of access plaguing people who don't have many options to do other than what they're doing. And so if we were to lift up, you know, all people, some things would, would start to work. Um, Jerry talked about maybe that work, the actual work of solving the immediate problems, lifting people out of poverty, you know, saving lives, saving rivers, maybe that work that we can do together are some of the are some of the things that actually create the trust based on the provable outcomes, based on the valuable, meaningful work on the projects we're engaged in together. Um, Rick talked about a venue to go to, some kind of crowdsourcing around a central, a central issue. Um, Sam talked about engaging the voice of people everywhere in their own communities as part of decision-making with immediately actionable insights on how they can make their lives better and move towards flourishing. Pete talked about how that is not one issue, but it's, it's everything from water to regenerative ag, to monetary policy, to legal policy, to economic policy, to tax policies, and was talking about carbon credits. And those are all inextricably related in this whole vessel of society that we're trying to navigate. So then Wendy talked about, well, maybe we're kind of all pieces of some kind of jigsaw puzzle. And if we could create a table and put ourselves on it and find the edges and the corners, maybe something really beautiful is there in the lifetimes of work that have, have shaped us all into what we are. And so then, the, then it's like, okay, well, let's get something stuck to the wall and start playing. And Jerry argued that we're throwing spaghetti and it's not sticking. So from, from a builder's standpoint, a few years back, what, what, I, what I tried to do when I said, okay, if we look down at worksite earth from outer space, and if that is a single finite vessel that we all inhabit, that we're trying to navigate through the millennia towards something that looks more like people with integrity flourishing in community and less like a hellish place where we're all exploiting people without ever more powerful weapons, then we have to look at that in whole as an aggregate project for planet earth that involves all people in the entirety to, of the living system without exception and try to figure out what the project or game is that we could play that might work that might last for hundreds of years or, or a thousand years that would cause cause the type of flourishing abundant life and culture and 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 heaven to manifest itself as we, as we want it to. And so my, my proposal based on, we're here on a, on a conversation on sense-making. And I think it was, um, someone mentioned the guy's name from M MIT, but I think he was also one of the early people to discover that in order for a mind, like as we think about artificial intelligence, is in order for a mind to be able to function, it has to be embodied in something. Um, you, you can't just have this abstract thing. And, and one of the things that I've been realizing is we're, we're talking about all these different parts of the whole. We're talking about sense-making. Maybe that's something like a mind, but that mind is one system of the total body of organs that have to function together in a, in a whole system. So a few years back, um, this is maybe from my background in joint ventures, but in, in large-scale infrastructure, almost everything is too big for any company to do on its own. And so you have to set up and jump into special purpose vehicles created for the things that are, that are too big for anyone. And what that does is it creates an embodiment through which you can interact with the world and bring intention into reality. And so I, I, I tried to think, okay, well, who could own that, that vessel? And the answer was no one. It had to exist on the basis of governance. And someone asked this question, how have we not figured out these issues of governance and power yet? And, and how do we engage all people in their own destiny as we all navigate towards, towards the future that we're trying to build? Um, and I, I think that's something like a, like a joint venture. It's something like a design build project. Um, and so for anybody that's interested, what, what the, the quest that I'm embarking on is I can't find an organization that is actually looking at worksite earth as a whole and gathering the smartest minds together 
to couple indigenous wisdom and spiritual wisdom and the best of science and technology into an actual plan of action with good governance to confront and overcome the totality of global issues we're, fish, we're facing, forge the future that we all want in a way that, that hopefully can last over time. Um, so that's kind of why I set up this, this Lionsburg legal and governance infrastructure as an empty vessel and starting point where we could, like Wendy said, bring pieces of the puzzle together into a place that nobody owned and existed as a commons for the good of all, that was publicly accountable, see how those pieces laid out, and then to Pete's point, actually start as if we were responsible for making it happen, resourcing and getting the different roadmaps aligned and, and people dedicated and focused and resourced to be able to actually compete these pieces of the puzzle in a way that was all, all also connected as central infrastructure through which we could make sense of and kind of solve all these things. So my, my suggestion is we treat this like a, like a, a joint venture to build something bigger than any of us that we, and it, it, so I'm gonna embark on that quest and I, I would love for anybody to join me, but I think we've been, we've been talking for a couple of years and it would do my heart so much good if we could, like Wendy suggested, get all the pieces on the table, go through Jerry's brain, get them all sorted out, then let's figure out in quarterly sprints how to get things you know, resourced, get people out of scarcity, dedicated time and, and get rolling. So that's my suggestion. So much love everybody. Sorry if that took too long, but I wanted to try to summarize and end very pragmatically with a suggestion. And we, um, we have all the legal and fundraising infrastructure and everything in place to start doing that and, and empowering things. Jordan, can thank I, you. Can Over I just now. quickly react uh, to what? Uh, Go ahead, David, and then I just said, so so I I'm uh, I can't say I've finished the book. I'm in the, I'm in part three of a I don't know fifteen hundred page book. Some of you may have read about the legendary Robert Moses. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert Moses uh, was a builder who started out as a big idealist, and Robert Caro wrote a book called The Power Broker about. Uh, Robert Moses. Uh, it's not a new book. I think it came out in 1973 or something like that. Um, the reason I'm mentioning the book, The Power Broker now is because it it's a cautionary tale of a guy who started out extremely um, um, idealistic, started out with the goal of reforming government and, uh, and so on. And he, he, he went down a very uh, complex and some would say uh, problematic path in, in order to get things done. And now, he was trying to get things done in the city of New York and in the state of New York, where he had uh, to overcome a lot of opposition. I think it might be naive of us to think that, Jordan, that if we, uh, that we're not going to meet with opposition. And the skills and, 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 and techniques and tactics and stratagems that it takes to overcome uh, uh, political opposition and institutional opposition are not trivial. So I'm not, I'm not naysaying at all. I'm just saying, let's have our eyes open about just how yeah, hard yeah. it is to make yeah. change when faced with institutional intransigence and, and, and powers that be. That, uh, yeah, David. David, I, I just uh, just uh, just was, uh, ten seconds of background. I, I just lost uh, my entire you know ten million dollars of net worth as a result of encountering corruption in the largest church church project I was doing for a religious organization, and the county and the the largest county by landmass in our great empire here in the states. Both complete complete corruption. Spoke truth to it encountered what happens when people speak truth to structures of institutional power and you know 150 families you know lost their jobs and and whatever so so what you're saying is is exactly true it's like this is this is not <laughs> this is not naive it's not for the faint of heart we are probably engaged in something like a battle for the future of our lives and society as we know it and it might be that you know this decade is the time to do it because if the existing forces that who are who depend on others' poverty and oppression and ignorance and darkness 
are armed with the in-breaking superpowers, it's going to be a lot harder. So it's so I think we need to we need to bring the fullness of that. And to your point on on Robert Moses, it's like yeah, it's 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 like the Lord of the Rings and worse, where it's like it, it's it's really hard. You know, Jerry mentioned power, and it's like yes, that's such a corrupting force, and it and it's like that gets to these issues of governance. It's like how do we set up based on everything we've learned as a human species, like how are we going to manage this so so that we are most likely to have the highest integrity result and and how do we set up the freedoms to to create the the checks the balances the yeah the, the wisdom leadership the the jedi councils whatever that sure. takes you know sure so so i uh, just since i was mentioned in the chat now briefly i just want to quickly react uh and connect to something jerry said so I'm also a student of uh, uh, the, the late Robert Ak uh, uh, Russ. Akoff. Russell Akoff, sorry, <laughs> Russell Akoff. I even went to the, the uh, place at university, the room in the University of Pennsylvania, which houses all his papers and libraries. I was lucky enough to be mentored by someone who worked with Russell Akoff. Russell Akoff wrote a book called Idealized Design. Idealized Design might be the right uh, starting point, responding to what uh, Peter Kaminsky uh, sorry, not Peter, uh, Gill, friend, uh, said. So yeah, I agree that it's better not to start with, woe is me, we're going to face opposition. Let's start with idealized design. It's a method, um, it's a framework, and I think it's the right, right approach. Thanks, David. And I actually was part of an idealized redesign project for a cough right after I graduated in Buenos Aires, Argentina, a story I can tell some of the time. Cool. Um, and I love the process. It's really interesting. <clears throat> Let's go Wendy, Rick, and then pause for a moment. We'll be at the 90 minute mark at least at that point. <clears throat> Maybe uh, Gil and Bill, you want to pitch in and then we want to consider. I think I have a feeling this is the beginning of a string of conversations around this topic uh, and sort of how and where to hold them, et cetera, we should talk about before wrapping. Uh, and also maybe a little bit of debrief about what's working about this and what's actually not. Uh, Wendy and Rick. Okay, so I've had about 10 thoughts since I put my hand up, so I'm going to try and make sense of them. Um, thank you, Jordan, for the, for the excellent summary and, and laying out kind of next steps and the, and the dialogue that followed that. I, um, for me, yeah, that's, that's kind of the motivation for me to create this tapestry and this framework because um, it really it becomes a, 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 a catalyst. They're, they're, the urgency is so there, right? And, and I'm hearing that as we, the more we talk. And when we move from the idealized version into application, I'm also sensing from most of the organizations that I'm, people that I'm talking to, a frustration, right? Of, of hey, we may even have a good sense. We may even have people have thought through entire new systems and entire new structures, but moving it into application, moving it into where it exists in the real world is a whole nother ball of wax. And that's what David, you were just talking to. As soon as you try to apply it, you know, you, we run into to a lot of, we need to be um, aware of and, really cognizant as we move into those spaces of what can happen, uh, who might get control of the information or what kind of other organizations are coming into play. For me, I, I was seeing that very clearly as well, that whole process of how we, we as humans go out, we need to explore into new ways to do things, kind of like active research on all levels, right? And then there are phases where we apply it in the real world. So that was actually became the X axis of, of, the, of the grid that I created. There are projects and there are people that are working in the spaces of expansion and spaces of divergent thinking and other ones that are working in spaces of convergent, making something, creating artifacts, making a new app, a new platform or whatever. And it's important. It's one of the ways that we can take this ball of yarn and start to pull it apart, right? Another one is like the sectors of society on a holistic framework. Uh, we can use, there's a million, there's lots out there. I picked one, it doesn't matter. The point is to start to pull this ball of yarn apart and then see who, who exists in the sector together, not just who, but what's the funding? Where is the funding aligning with this? And um, where are the resources aligning with this? So if you're a person with a question rather than something to offer, if you have a need rather than something to offer, at least you'll get closer to finding some of those resources. So that goes back to what Samuel was saying. There's a lot of people in this sphere who knew about donut economics, right? Like if you had had a place to go where you could see 
what are people talking about in economics where they're exploring new concepts, not necessarily what's what's already out there, but right, what are the resources around that and what it'll at least get you closer, right? So anyway, that's, I love what I'm hearing, yay. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, Michael, I want to apologize. I missed you in the in the lineup entirely. Let me go to you right this second. Uh, my, my sincere apologies. I lost my thread of, of who had stepped in and who hadn't. Thanks. Um, I, uh, I know I missed the beginning of the call and I came in on, uh, on the, the mention of horizon sharing, horizon scanning and um, and since since then, I posted something that, about that in the in the chat in relation to to factor um, uh, my project. Um, but since then, um, I'm also hearing. Let me see. I, I'm just going to read some things from a couple of notes that I was making. I I'm just really struck by. Out of what Wendy said, Jordan said, you know, many people have brought up um, the notions of of individual pieces of information which have no meaning on their own, um, or little meaning, or not as much meaning as somebody thinks they have. Um, making more of a difference when they are brought together and connected. And that, you know, interoperability between different platforms and different efforts is the key. There's, there's a study that I mentioned to some of you that uh, Ali Bream did of all the people who are having meetings like this, um, the OGMs, the CTAs, the MozFests, the um, you know, just all, all the people who are on this page, he counted over 400 of them. And, and us deciding to have another or, or, or that, you know, we're the one that's going to unite them all is, is not realistic. And interoperability is the key so that you know, if we all if we all have our own stashes of information, we can only do so much. But if we could all bank it essentially, and and create you know the ability as you have with currency to exchange between you know it's it's a it's a it's a substance that you know is readable in different contexts and can be exchanged among different groups interoperably. Um, and everybody is in control of, the, of what they generate, whether they know of what its significance is or not. Um, and you know, working on giving people the interoperable tools to retain and access and organize the information they have. It might just be one picture they took of something that they can't explain, but if they can put it into this system that interoperates, that allows the futurists, the researchers, the, you know, the medical researchers to see this data point and see how it connects to other things that they have access to in other silos, um, that's what's key. So it's like sort of, it's at once this, bank and, and a commons. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I was DMing to Jordan, you know, that, that the existence of, um, of a place for an effort like Factor to contribute to the commons, contribute itself to the commons even, is something that's lacking. And um, yeah, um, sorry, I'm, I'm tripping over a lot of the thoughts that I was, was having, but um, you know, the, 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 the individual granular 
taggable, connectable pieces of content that each of us possess, we need to have an interoperative way to share them. And I'm really interested in talking to anyone who's um, interested in that, which I think most of you are. So thanks. Thanks, Michael. And we had a series of calls called the Generative Commons calls that spun out of a, an exciting conversation we had some months ago. And then we, we didn't sort of complete that task. We, we set aside that, that set of conversations, but the notion of a generative commons was, I think the thing you're describing, Michael, which is where do we put the stuff we wanna contribute into this hopefully generative commons, right? And, and the idea was to have a generative commons agreement, which would be, which would read something like, hey, by my participation in this group, which is under this umbrella of terms of, of engagement, um, I agree that we're aiming, we know that some of us need to make a living in different ways, but we're aiming toward putting everything we can into the commons and making it useful to everybody else on the planet. So there, there was that, that impetus. Uh, let's go, Rick, then uh, Actually, go ahead, Michael. Just, just so oh, you were just saying, I just want to respond that, that yeah. I didn't get to say that paradoxically, I think that um, decentralized is key to the commons. I mean, you know, everybody individually having the access to the information that they generate, which is now in the hands of others, whether it's, you know, the, the stuff that Facebook knows about you or Google knows about you or your doctor knows about you, or, you know, just the, the data that you generate, um, having it decentralized, having you able to add to it and organize it, and then therefore able to usefully share it when somebody's trying to theorize around something or like, you know, I think this is happening around climate change or this is happening around epidemiology. And, you know, I want anonymized information from X many people and you have the ability to give them that information in a snap. So that's, that's the interoperability out of our decentralization that allows a kind of information commons. Thanks, Michael. Big task. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, Rick, then Gil. Yeah, I just want to compliment Jordan on his synthesis. I, I sent something in jest to you, but I thought it was a very nice summary, but I'd like to elaborate on the issue of the power structures. You mentioned um, oligarchies, but oligarchies are also in, 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 informed by kleptocracies as well. So the whole economic financial system is a very shady enterprise, and we, sh we shouldn't be naive about it because those vested interests are going to are going to come against us with anything that's likely to disrupt their power. I coined this phrase, and I, I'll, I'd be interested in Shimon maybe commenting on this. He may not like this, but um, you know, we 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 have what I call a so a social leadership personality disorders, who are in power. They're megamaniacs, the sociopaths, narcissists, and authoritarians, and we haven't worked out how to develop governance structures to put them on the sidelines. And you know, as long as the power is centrally corrupt. Uh, you know, decentralization, yes, I, I think sometimes that gets romanticized. You still need to have some central governance uh, to guide it. And so one of the things that I like to talk about is the distinction between values and virtues. And I hear a lot of business people talk about values and, and virtues, and, and they're not very clear about it. And in fact, value, our value structures, our contrasting value structures is the thing that actually sets us up against each other. And we need to think about what is the constellation of virtues that's going to govern our governance proposals. And if we're not clear about our virtues, then it's very difficult to provide guidance to our con conflicting value systems that are always going to be there. And so the idea of unity is a myth. The best we can do is alignment. So I'm not this unity and unify unifying themes, you know. They're, they're, good in, they're good in songs and music and whatever, but we're not going to get the alignment. I and mean, we're not going to get the unity. We have to work on alignment and people looking the same direction. So we have some middle ground that we can see, yeah, this is in our, all of our best interest. I'm Rick and I'm done spoken. Thanks, Rick. Uh, I could just, let's go to, 
uh, let's go to Gil, then Bill, and then back to Kevin, who sort of checked in earlier, but I just want to see what else you had uh, to throw in if you wanted to. Uh, so Gil. Yeah, so I'm late to the call. I, I apologize, sort of. I've been on a two-hour conversation reading and discussing the late Rabbi Jonathan Sachs's last book called Morality, which is an incredible read uh, and touches on many of the things we're talking about here with great insights. So um, that number one. Number two, wow to this call. I've sort of come in drinking from a fire hose for the last, I don't know, 40 minutes. I'm, I'm trying to catch up and scan the chat, which is fastest moving chat I've seen on one of our calls. Um, so, you know, trying to catch my breath here. Let me pick up uh, on what Rick said, actually, by way of what Michael said. Um, but what really strikes me at this point, yeah, Michael, there uh, no doubt there are more than 400 groups. Uh, maybe there's 4,000, maybe there's 40,000, the more the merrier, that's great. This is a planetary phenomenon of, you know, people who sense this moment and want to move in a particular direction and how that stitches together is part of the mystery. Um, who are we to say that we're the ones will, will unite them all? Well, we're not. It, I, want to, I want to challenge that in two ways. Uh, as Rick said, uniting them all isn't the job. Um, and who are we? Well, no, we're not the ones to unite them all. We're the ones to do what we're good at doing and to offer what we're good at doing to the world and see who wants to play. And that's the nature of how things happen. You, you, know, you, you, you make an offer, you make a provocation, people respond or they don't. Um, um, what I'm concerned about here is that the perfect is the enemy of the good. And um, um, you know, we are right now in this country uh, reaping the harvest of 50 years of a concerted political strategy, going back to the Powell Memorandum, to what we've seen been playing out on the radical right for these last 50 years. It's not a random thing. It's not disorganized. It's not, not trying to find unity. It's not trying to build alignment. It's saying, here's a plan who wants to play. And in their case, they had it well finance, which is a certain kind of advantage, but not the only necessary piece of that. Um, so I'm just really, I, I'm, I'm sort of shocked and not surprised that whatever, whatever you all did that led up to Jordan's summary, Jordan, that was an astounding thing that you just did um, and summarized what I guess was a couple of hours of conversation. Um, and I'd love to talk with you more. Uh, but in addition to summarizing the conversation, Jordan, put an offer on the table. It was very explicit. It was very grounded. Uh, I don't know if it's the right thing to do or not, but he put this offer on the table and no one responded to it. We went, we, it kind of the conversation continued about this and that and other things that are interesting and relevant, but um, I'm kind of stunned that we didn't respond to that provocation and say, yeah, that's a good place to start, or no, that's not a good place to start. David, David's first response was to talk about how complicated it is to get shit done in a corrupt world. Well, that's true. David, forgive me, I don't know you, but it's obvious. And for me, it didn't add anything. To, it didn't build on what Jordan offered. It was kind of a diversion of like, so yeah, we, we do need to deal with that at some point, but where I want to start is, what's the world we want? Can we take, you know, can we start from what Jordan put on the table? I don't mean to point it at you specifically, Jordan, but you, you know, you build shit in the world. You have a certain sensibility about getting stuff done. So, you know, it's a starting point. And what, you know, should we perhaps, well, you know, what if we said, yes, we'd like to pursue that further and then have some other conversations, which we dive in on that, um, you know, look at what's the magnetizing vision, Look at what's the, what are some of the key steps to get there along the way very much bring up the concerns that David raised and that other people will raise, but in the context of a momentum towards something, not as just kind of a, you know, shit is hard to do because we know shit is hard to do. Um, end of rant, sorry. Um, Gil, thank you for the rant and thank you for bringing the attention, our, your, our attention back to what Jordan did and the offer Jordan made. I feel like I'm actually standing a little close to Jordan's offer because he and I became friends a year or more ago and we've been involved in lots of these sorts of conversations and we're just overdue now for a check-in to figure out, okay, what, where, how does this go? Uh, and Jordan's meta project is, is, is pretty familiar and high in my mind. So I didn't go back to it partly because I'm like, damn, that Jordan, I, I just need to sit down and talk with you about this. And maybe that's a conversation we have you know, with a broader group so that you don't have that conversation 20 times over. Um, 
Uh, and it's important that we organize ourselves in some way or ways that make sense to us. And the ways we organize won't make sense to everybody. So let's figure out different ways to organize where we have some resonance and some common goals out ahead of us. Um, Jordan, would you want to step in? Yeah, would it be helpful if I if I took um, like three minutes to try to to try to um, very specifically describe what what I think it could look like to engage in such a enterprise together? Go for it. Um, I, there's no, there's no, we've like lost all our language to, to talk about these things, but it seems like if a group of people is going to come together, you have to decide like, well, what is it that we're coming together to do? And I think what we're trying, we're trying to figure out is, is how do we navigate the vessel of society through the millennia towards its best and highest potential? And how do we do that in a way that that works for us individually in a way that works for our families in a way that works for our local communities that also doesn't set us at war with each other. And so you, you, you have to stack up all those things. And so it, in, at, the, at the leading edge of the technology we've developed over thousands of years of how to bring attention into reality, there's very proven processes, um, like let's, you could call them something like lean integrated program management, but, but I think we can do better than that. But it's like you, in the architect's mind, you have a design for the, for the world of total integrated well-being development and right relationship that we're moving towards. You have all the constituent elements that it would take in order to manifest that, you know, from governance to learning to well-being to the way we, we treat our, our waters to the way we produce and consume food to the way we do everything, right? So you, you stack up all the elements in like a work breakdown structure that would have to manifest in order for that world to do it. And so, so you end up with a very concrete picture of reality by engaging the, the specialists and the, the engineers and the experts in each of those fields. And so you, you get the picture of the total, the total cathedral we're trying to build with all the attendant systems. So that's like step one is, is a shared vision and goal that's big enough to gather around. And, and that's something like like the, the highest intention and greatest good that we can conceive of for all people in all places and times. Your second step is then to analyze the existing forces and conditions. So you create the gap that you're transforming from what currently is in all its, in all its terror and hardness and, and challenges to this better thing. And then there's, there's a technology called pole planning that's rooted in, in like the Toyota manufacturing system and adapted to volatile real world environments and construction where you then just backwards plan. It's like, well, if we started here and, and got there, what would have happened along the way? And you do that in reverse so you don't scare yourself into thinking you can't actually achieve it. And so what you end up with is you end up with a series of milestones at increasingly more granular level of detail across all the different set, across the the total properly ordered set of goals that have to simultaneously be achieved to bring the totality into existence. And then you end up with a whole group that has engaged in that process, looking at like a 90 day world that says, okay, here's the new world that we're moving towards. Here's the old world that we're departing from on this quest towards our destiny. Here's the approximate steps and milestones across the total range of things that would have had to happen. And based on that, here's what we're gonna do in the next 90 days. And then based on that, here's a few commitments that we can make to, to each other. So Gil's gonna do some things and I'm gonna do some things and Jerry's gonna do some things. And, and here's the way those are, are related. And you can get it off the ground just like you, you send a person to, to the moon or you, you build a, a, a roadway or you do a Manhattan project and you, you just start resourcing the intelligently formulated critical path so that you're, you're measurably bringing the stated reality into the, and then if you're going to the moon and you decide you haven't invented the math yet, then it's like, okay, well, we need to invent new math, add it to the list, right? It just becomes a pragmatic reality. So if we don't know how to govern ourselves, if we don't have wisdom leadership, if we don't know how to hear the voices of the people, it's like, all right, let add it to the list. And it, and it all just ends up in a structured plan of action that you're e either are or are not measurably executing on each month. And then I think if you can, if you can be able then to send out, so, so when we're building a, a half billion dollar dam, then what you do is each month you send out 
a report to the owners, and let's say that's the people of the earth, and you say, okay, people who are supervising the project for Worksite Earth, here's what we plan to do this month based on the critical path. Here's what worked and what didn't work. Here's the challenges that we're facing. And here's the resources we need in order to get, you know, Pete and Wendy assigned to be able to advance the critical path and all these different places, right? And then you, you do or don't execute it and you send out another monthly report. And, and that's, I think, can be the basis for a massive crowdfunding campaign. If we can get people following along, going back to these things getting published, if it's like, okay, we have a growing snowball of people executing on a critical path, reporting out very pragmatically measurable results. And if this is valuable to you, then, then let's get involved and let's all fuel this and let's all lift each other up. And I think there's a, there's a specific way we can do that. So that's what I think it looks like. Thanks, Jordan. Um, now I absolutely have to bounce from this call near the top of the hour. I'm happy to pass the con to someone else and let the call proceed. And I'm going to pass the mic momentarily to Bill, asking him to recap everything and tie a nice bow on this whole conversation. And awesome. Just awesome. I don't have much to add. I said, well, say personally, I've taken the time I've been involved with OGM and stuff to come across how much I need to unlearn about what I learned as a young white boy growing up in New York City in the United States. Um, and it's been uh, generative and uh, embarrassing and... Uh, but one thing I've come across recently is I've started to do some reading from people who are not, did not grow up in the United States that I grew up in and looking at certain, uh, just looking at a book by uh, called Banana Leaves, which is written by a young scientist, her last name was Hernandez, and it's about indigenous science, which I think is gonna be extremely uh, educational for me. Um, I really appreciate what Jordan has laid out. The one thing that came to my mind while I was listening, I've read this uh, wonderful book by Amitav Ghosh that's out now called The Nutmeg's Curse, which is a very interesting view of basically what it's been like to be on the other side of colonialism. But in there, he writes about the people, the protesters at Standing Rock, were not really presenting a set of demands or advocating policy positions. They were living and performing an alternate way of life. So I would like to propose that perhaps we can think about how, how to carry on a project as intricate as Jordan proposed. And an alter, is there an alternate way to us to, you know, divide up the responsibility for authority, labor, because I'm, you know, my background's in uh, chemistry and engineering and software. So, you know, I can go to the fishbone as fast as anyone, but um, I just am looking for different ways for us to be together and kind of make, pushes me to where Wendy is going with stuff, pushing me into the world that we, would like to inhabit so i think jordan could list out basically it's the we need that list we absolutely need that list but i wonder if there's just we can i don't know how to do it i mean i really don't know how to do it so i'm really out on the edge of like i'm on the edge but there is something in what i'm reading about alternatives to the western colonial enlightenment view of how the world universe economics political power social arrangements are that perhaps well i'm you know i'd like to know more about it thanks bill um i'll just say one quick word with the, uh, that you brought up and, and i thought you did a great job putting a bow on the conversation i really appreciate that um which is uh this is sort of conversation about hierarchies are terrible and we're walking into a leaderless world. And I'm like, not so fast, not so much. I believe a lot in temporary hierarchies, meaning 
we get together and we're like, let's make a movie. Awesome. And then Susie says, oh, I've made a movie before. Let's, you know, here's how we organize. Let's do this, 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 this. And then we're like, great. And for a while, Susie leads us into that effort until it evolves into something else and until some work gets done and so forth and so on. And then somebody else picks up a piece of that and then spins off and, and forks off and, 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 and so forth. And each of those becomes a little hierarchy because we subordinate ourselves happily and willingly to somebody with a good vision and some superior into, uh, uh, experience in the field and a plan. And that, that works pretty well. Um, but a lot of us are holding very different visions about how this thing should evolve. Like, like Rick, if you and Jordan sat down and compared notes, I think you both got pretty fully fledged visions that aren't necessarily the same sort of thing, but there's probably a lot of in, a lot in common there. That would be a really interesting conversation to hear, right? And so we don't have good mechanisms to report back to each other and to the center, to the generative commons, if I will, about how those things might evolve. And we don't have uh, ways of shifting. And here the metaphor I pick up for some reason is the view master. Like I'm interested in us sharing lots of data and information and then periodically click of the view master. And now we're looking at it through Wendy's grid. And, and the, because Wendy's grid for the thing we're trying to solve right now for the thing this subgroup is facing is a really nice model. And let's go run with that. And that'll spill out into some tasks and project plans and so forth. And we'll go do that for a while. And then we'll hit a wall or, or bump into some other projects. And then we might have to bump around and find a different way of working for another stretch of period. And I'm really interested in what does this environment look like where each person coming into this flow, smelling that there's people trying to fix stuff can find their way to the models that work for them, the tasks that work for them, the, the collaborators that work for them to take a bite out of the elephant because the way you eat an elephant is one bite at a time. And I think we're, we're facing like not just an elephant, of course, we're facing mega problems uh, that we wind up in every now and then on OGM conversations. Um, so I'm going to need to boogie right now. Happy to pass the con to whoever thinks they'll be on for a little while and wrap the call whenever you wish to. I've, I've got a jam here too, but may I just make one, one comment to get in the end of the trans transcript on the being versus doing and the the integrated program management report approach and the functional unity that we need to act as if we were a body and and have the coordinated effort to execute and i i really appreciate what you what you said jerry it's like it's it's very nice to think that we could suddenly self-organize with no leadership or structure into something resembling but but we can't and so, but if the project is to change our way of being, then, then that requires that we, we design that together. You know, that becomes part of the part of the project and maybe the project itself is to design our new way of being and our new way of relating to one another, our new way of collaborating, our new way of sharing and allocating resources and responsibility and, you know, all, all of those different things. And so I think it's like, it's simultaneously a project management approach and sitting at the feet of indigenous elders to learn about how to functionally be in community over. And so it's like, I think we can do a hundred percent of those both together. And then you have a, have a complete picture. You have a, a way of being that actually brings into reality the, the future we all desire for our children and grandchildren. Love that. Thanks, Jordan. Um, Eric, do you mind if I pass the con to you? Can I just ask a quick question, which is any thoughts um, before you leave on, um, did he just pat, he just dropped off, didn't he? Ugh. I wanted to ask like what next steps? So I guess we'll figure that out through email or whatever other channels. Well, we could stay on if you want to continue talking. If you were asking Jordan, Wendy, he's still here. No, it wasn't, although Jordan, okay. sure, to ask that question too, I was thinking just in terms of OGM. Um, Asking Jerry, you know, if there's any, if he came away with any, you know, next steps and his thoughts, but um, but we'll figure it out. It's fine. But I have to. You would, if you if you would like, Wendy, I could tell you what how I would do it. <laughs> On a building yeah. project, I've discovered it's it's nearly impossible to act in harmony as a group without regular rhythms of of communication, and so my my proposal to Jerry is going to be that we position the open global mind that we're trying to build in parallel with the other organ systems that need to be brought into existence, um, which include the ones that, that you're working on. Um, and so what I was going to do here, uh, my goal was uh, at, on February 1st, basically to kick off project meetings for that meta project idea to create that, that table 
so to speak, where we could lay out and see what the puzzle pieces are and then start developing critical paths, seeing how they relate to one another, see who needs what, what resources and, and how we start bringing into reality this body, this conscious body that can create the future that we want. And so I, I can, I think I, if it were me, I would um, treat it like a joint venture process and start setting up regular meetings and then kind of teach people the basic process and communication rhythms that allow us to function and share resources and stuff. So if you're interested in that, um, I'll, I'll probably try to kick that off um, February 1st. And then I hope that also brings into existence the fullness of what a open global mind is and the fullness of what a tapestry is and the fullness of what you know funding mechanisms are and all the different things we need. So. Okay, great. Thanks. I look forward to hearing more about that, Jordan. I'd be definitely interested. Okay, cool. Cool. Thank you, everyone. I have to drop off. Bye. Okay. Yeah. Jordan, very, right. quickly, very quickly, Jordan, I like the metaphor of the tapestry, but I think there's so many different threads here that um, I think to, to try and pull things together into a tapestry, there almost needs some pre-planning uh, of what that tapestry might be. Because I, I, come, I come from healthcare, so I'm not in the business world. I come from an equity perspective. I've always worked in this space. My, I have a generalist mindset. It's so different to your mindset. I can tell. That's not bad. It's good. But we have to have people with very contrasting mindsets to come to the table to be able to, uh, yeah. You know, that, that's, that's, that's the pre-planning about the co-design. So anyway. Yeah, so, so we've been, just for a little, little background, we've been... Uh, We've had some some a pretty diverse range of minds um, engaged in building kind of the underground infrastructure for something like this for a few years, and so there's there's quite a bit of depth and hundreds of pages of, of writing and thought from a variety of different perspectives that have you know from indigenous wisdom to people who have built billions of dollars of, of infrastructure to doctors and attorneys and governance experts and stuff that have all kind of weighed in on the framework. And, and then, so I think what you just said is key. It's like, okay, well now let's, let's get the right people based on who we all know into the right space to co-create something. And we're going to have to all kind of learn and get up to speed on each other's bodies of work and like what we've all learned through our lifetimes. And that the totality of all those perspectives and skills is then what would let us go. Okay. Well, based on everybody's in this room, we can probably execute this next 30 days and get from here to here. And then we'll we'll look out from that mountaintop, hopefully with even some more bright minds in the room and do it again. Um, but, but I agree completely. It's like all about who's in the room and, and humbly co-creating based on our best collective wisdom and skill. But it's also getting people who are not even, you know, who's who are the voiceless involved. You know, that's the one thing about that book about rules for revolutionaries, which was so key was yeah. the success of Bernie's work. I mean, whatever you think of his politics is separate. Just look at what he was able to do. Correct. And yeah. he basically handed over his message to his, his, and it was incredibly effective because people bought in, whether you agreed with it or not. But there's a lot to be learned about self-organizing, self-generating systems. And you have to let go of your, you know, your own particular cherished way of doing things because they're going to change yeah. it and they're not necessarily going to do a good job of it all the time. Uh, and the book goes into that. So yeah. it's a question of how it can, you know, create that type of uh, uh, sort of massive involvement. Um, yeah. And, it, you know. and I think it really, it helps like that when, when we get out of the short term isolated thinking to think about, okay, well, this, this thing that we're creating has to be able to help billions of people flourish over yeah. the, the next thousand years. And so it's like, you stop exactly. thinking about yourself and you go, okay, well, what are the processes and mechanisms and way of being by, mm -hmm. and what are the rules by which a society can, can evolve through the generations cooperatively to bring about the, the reality. And so, yeah, what you're saying is so true. And it's like, that's totally lost in our political discourse. Cause we're, we, it's like, exactly. we're, it, it's like you're in one nation and one political party thinking about an election. It's like, mm -hmm. That's not, how we State. need to be yeah. thinking. Stacey, we we need to be thinking about where we're. Oh, I just wanted to make sure, uh, Stacy. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to say to this point. I really think that there was something that Sam Rose could inject to this 
that would come even before this point. And that was like my hope for this call was to really focus on the question and the way he framed it in order to then move to what Jordan's talking about. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think, yes. So Stacy, I think what it's like, these things are so hard because it's like, where do you start when we all are bringing lifetimes of work to the table and what you're, what you're talking about is exactly right. And so I think we've all been parts of these groups that have approached these things and gone through processes. And I think what you're pointing to is so critical that it's like, there's a, a pre-process for whatever new centers of gravity is going to come together where it's like, we have to maybe be patient and back up several steps and go, okay, if we wanted to get there to that level of trust and cooperation, then the group of people interested in that would have to kind of start over at the beginning and go through the wisest process we could all design to make sure that we are are sharing the a vision and value structure and, and kind of go. So I really respect what you're saying and I think you're exactly right. Yeah, thank you. I think there's been a lot of information that we need to digest. So like if we take a step back, rewatch this and make notes and before we come together again, we can then share what directions we're thinking and uh, yeah, come to a consensus. That sounds practical. fantastic. Yeah. Well, it's so good to be with you guys. Thank you. Yes, Enjoy. very quickly. We have a resource that we can read about uh, everything you've been talking about. The transcript is will it be public? saved. Um, Jerry's going to post the chat and the transcript and the video. When yeah, no, I'm talking about time. more in depth, uh, more in depth than what's been covered here. So this has just oh, been yeah. high level. Yeah. Uh, he was talking, I, asking Jordan. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, Rick, I'm, I'm, I'm trying. I've been mostly communicating in forums like this, um, but okay. I, I can, um, I can send you some things if you're interested. I mean, there's, I've, yeah, I love to, yeah. love to read it. Yeah, I like to do deep dive, deep dive. <laughs> this has been so a horizontal. This has been very much of a horizontal level, and there's times when you have to go deep dive into stuff. <laughs> Yeah. I think they call it a spike in agile, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. Anyway, okay. Pete, ask the conversation. Pete, it's ask good to see you. I've been I've been missing you. Just to say that before we jump off. I appreciate you. I appreciate your unique skill sets and I miss you. So look forward to more time together here in the new year. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. Right. Eric Bye. and Rick, great to meet you guys. Stacy. Uh,